the face of Southern California is the face of Channel 2. This is a story about awakenings and realization. A story about how fear and intolerance can turn into trust and acceptance. About how stereotypes and prejudice can give way to understanding and compassion. This is a story about change. Good evening, I'm Bree Walker. In the aftermath of the May Rebellion, Los Angeles began to question its identity as a multicultural community. In fact, serious doubts were raised about the premise that such a community can even exist. Tonight, we're here to show you that it can. And it has, every summer, at least for a week at a time. I'm Jose Sanders. For the last 42 years, Brotherhood Sisterhood, a week-long camp sponsored by the National Conference of Christians and Jews, has taught high school students the skills necessary to build just such a community. The tools used are simple, honesty, communication, and patience. But what happens here is anything but simple. The interactions you will see in the next hour are real, sometimes heart-wrenchingly real. But the pain these campers feel is what motivates them to rethink their attitudes toward racism and sexism. Most of these kids are unclear as to why they should change their attitudes. Camp Brotherhood Sisterhood gives them a reason to change. Brother Sisterhood, my teachers, not necessarily that we're all the same, but that we're all different and we can all appreciate each other, each other and the fact that we are different. My sleeping bag's at the bottom. I was a smart camper. Bye, honey. Bye, Bye honey. Have a good time. Bills, wallets. Bye. The Odyssey begins at Plummer Park. But within the hour, the buses leave behind the palm trees of Hollywood for the evergreens at Pilgrim Pines and the mountains above Yucaipa. Once they arrive, it becomes clear this week will be an uphill battle. Hey, a little bit slower here! The whole community meets to get acquainted and begin the program, but soon the large assembly splits into smaller gatherings called dialogue groups. NCCJ staffer Henry Aronson will guide this group Whatever through the week. So today we're going to talk about ourselves and how we feel about being here and all that kind of stuff and getting used to each other. So we're also going to do some silly stuff so you can whatever laugh at each other or laugh at yourself. <laughs> Call me Sam and uh, I think I'll go with the shouting. <laughs> Everybody know it? Okay. Sam, everybody's gonna shout. Ready on three. One, two, three. The icebreaker does the trick. Before long, the campers are paired off and given one minute to tell each other their life stories. It is their first step on the road to meaningful dialogue. Go! Okay, my last try. Born in San Francisco. Have anything you wanted? Maybe. Like, hold on. Um, I used to be stubborn. Yeah. Then I uh, grew up in San Juan, I made friends, and I went to, ended up going to a private high school. On the ref, I don't remember, okay, so I um, went to high school, got really good grades, okay, in junior high, got really good grades. And then I went there since third grade, and then I went to Haskell Junior High. When you were telling your life story, what did you tell? What important detail did you put in? What important details did you leave out? What did you leave out if you left anything out? You know what I mean? What was your partner like? What was it like listening to him or her if he was looking at you? What was it like talking to somebody who all they did was listen? And I want you to think about how did your partner affect you? You know, how they were sitting, how they were looking, you know, how close were they to, how far, what they looked like to you. You know, she looks like somebody I hate, so I'm not really gonna talk to her. <laughs> or he looks like somebody I like. You know, how did they affect you? And really think about how you're like, you know, how, what kind of trust or not is developing between you and your partner. 
I'm really bored, or I think he hates me. You know, what do you think about each other? Because that's where stereotypes come from. You know, start beginning to think about what you think about each other already, because that's important. The first conversations are a little awkward and superficial, but they open the way for the much tougher talks that will take place later in the week. And my favorite thing in doing is, you know, forcing them to talk with each other. Tell her, you know, just she's right there, you know, talk to her. And it's going to feel real stilted for the first meetings, because I'm going to do that all the time. Just jump in, tell her, tell him. But my whole goal is, is by like day three, that they'll just start talking to each other. And we realized that the circle of 100 people, different people, had met for three years, and this was the first time that a Jew had been present. Each day, and representatives of a said, oh, different religion know, hold an informal discussion learn, and a short worship service. Today, it's the Jewish Havdalah, a weekly event signaling the end of the Sabbath. For many of the campers, it's the first exposure they've had to the Jewish faith. Some are reluctant at first, but by the time the ceremonial candle is lit, the hesitancy is gone. I've never before had a dollar with anyone who wasn't Jewish. And um, I think that it's so incredible that I'm standing here with all these non-Jews and everyone is so interested. And I'm like trying to explain to everyone, like, you know, the person sitting next to me what it means. I'm like saying so much that no one's understand, even understanding what I'm saying. This is like a really incredible feeling because I've never, ever had this before. How does it feel for you to be biracial? It is the most confusing thing. At least once a day, the campers will meet in groups with members of their own race only. For those who are biracial, choosing which group to belong to can be painfully difficult. I don't want to be seen as one way. I don't want to be seen as Latino, just Latino or whatever, or just white, you know? And I feel like if I, if I have to choose one of the groups, I'm going to always have to be constantly, but I'm also, you know, but I'm also, you know, I think I have to keep justifying myself, you know? Like first all, you know? ourselves a group hug. I really appreciate um, how much most of us here share and all of us have truly shared sensitive and emotional things and I really want to respect that and say that I'm really, really, really proud of you all to share. Um, it just brings us all closer and know that you have support and you're not alone. Each night the community gathers around a glowing campfire. As the days go by and the work becomes harder, the soothing... How do you feel that, it has to, that the way you speak and stuff has to do with you being black? I mean, you know, how does that, you being black, tie into um, the way you talk and stuff? Being honest looks a little different for me than it does for you. And being patient is a little different for me than it is for you. On day two, the campers began to learn skills that will help them throughout the week, like a list of communication guidelines. The campers were asked to be honest, have patience, take risks, be sensitive to the ways people of different cultures communicate, and to speak only for themselves. <laughs> The importance of communication becomes clear in this morning's exercise. The campers are taken into the cafeteria and not allowed to leave until they finish filling out a sheet of information. Unfortunately, the questions are in Japanese and the translators speak French and Spanish, but no English. By the time the exercise is over, the campers no longer take communication for granted, and they have also developed some empathy for immigrants. Can you read this? I felt frustrated, but then it was like a game. 
but then I think in my in my own sense I felt like the frustration that you know to some extent um, the frustration that immigrants might feel and I want to talk to any immigrants who want to help me through that because that's a barrier I have with immigrants. Throughout the rest of the day the campers hear the communication guidelines again and again be honest and patient risk be culturally sensitive. Without those skills, communication can be difficult, even among people who speak the same language. And I don't feel comfortable speaking slang, so when, so I don't hang around people who speak slang or, um, or people who just don't speak standard English. So far, I haven't like come up to anybody and um, who is black who have to introduce myself, um, because. I'm, I'm afraid that I won't understand them and um, they would, we're just too different and they might not like me because I don't speak the way I, they do. Tina's admission of her bias against people speaking uh, slang opens the door for some real progress. Say, you know? Charlie brings it up in the racially separate uh, meetings. Uh, some of our, you know, you know, we were talking about in, our, in one of our groups that we had, she's, they said they wouldn't try, they wouldn't make the first, they said they try not to talk to black people because they said that we use slang. It's not like they're prejudiced against them, but they said they use standardized English. Mm -hmm. And they said the way we talk, they can't understand, you know. And when I do speak to a uh, Oriental that I met, you know, a Pacific Islander, when I do say something, they like they answer me back, and we have a conversation. My name is Tina. Um, I'm very, very nervous right now. And then in the evening, Tina decides to take a Coming big risk, facing the whole community. She uses the communication guidelines and takes the first step. She acknowledges the barrier she has and asks for help in hurdling it. And I'm taking a very big risk right now. I've decided that I want to risk and be honest and be totally not what I usually am. <laughs> and I'll be patient. I ask that of you. And I know that not everyone will like me. And I'm telling you now that I accept that, but I'm, I can't say that I will like you either. <laughs> a stereotype is like a generalization about a certain group of people based on like an experience with that with like a member of that group of people first question is whether you agree whether you disagree day three's program begins with a simple exercise the campers gather in the center of the room and a series of statements are read those who agree go to one side of the room those who disagree go to the other take a moment to Look where you are, maybe look who else is in the same place, look who's not in the same place, look across the room, what do you think about that? What do you think about them? Back to the same. The judgments seem harmless, but as the community meets once again, it becomes clear that isn't the case. All right, first of all, I have a problem with people from private schools. Um, one of my stereotypes is that you guys have it too easy. And when I saw a couple of private school people over there saying that public school kids are, are dumber, that pisses me off because I bust my ass at, at public schools. That's all I have. I can't afford a private school. The point is made. The stereotype that private school students are smarter than their public school counterparts has offended and angered some of the members of the community. The fact that several public school students agreed with the stereotype doesn't help much. It's a stereotype. I have the stereotype that all private schools, not all, but most private school students are more intelligent than me. With the groundwork for stereotyping laid, the group begins to deal with specific issues of prejudice. This morning, it's ableism, how stereotypes about a person's disabilities can cause a barrier between members of the community. If they seem like they can't talk or something like that, then I might not go up and talk to them. But if they seem like they're somewhat there more than others, then I might go try up and talk to them. But I treat them a lot different than I treat my friends. Um, 
I treat them like little kids. While half of the group discusses those barriers, the other half is outside being blindfolded or gagged or having plugs put in their ears to simulate the loss of speech and hearing and sight. He could see, he could see, it's not fair. I can't see. Yes, you can. No, I can't. What? Yes, you can. Several are made to function without the use of arms or legs or both. Their short-term disabilities quickly begin to open the door to long-term understanding and compassion. When I was preparing for the exercise, just all of a sudden, sorry, just all of a sudden, my life was in somebody else's hand. Somebody was guiding me. I could no longer act as myself. I needed somebody else to do things for me or tell me where to walk. And as we were walking in, or as I was standing up, I don't remember, um, I think it was Vanessa who said, oh, watch out. And I got really scared. You know, it's, I got scared. I thought I was going to bump in or fall or something. And she said she was just kidding. And that might have been true. But as a blind person, I didn't want to trust, I didn't want to trust anybody anymore. Jonathan, start with Jonathan. What did Jonathan do at school? What's he involved in? But the main thrust of the program for day three is to get the campers to acknowledge their tendency to form judgments based on stereotypes. What would they presume about a person based on nothing more than that person's appearance? I see her sort of like sitting in class, putting on makeup, talking to her girl friends about who's cute and who's not. I think maybe she's um got a like one of those bugs, maybe a convertible kind. I don't know if they have one, but maybe letting the wind go through her hair and everything, you know, <laughs> and just cruising. How about Will? What kind of stuff would he be involved in? <laughs> <laughs> It's clear that the campers can come up with an entire life profile of a person they have never met. That realization is apparent during dialogue group. I guess I do stereotype a lot, you know. I guess I do. So, and I'll, I don't think I want to change, but I think that um, I should, like, not let those stereotypes stop me from talking and meeting people, yeah. Well, how about me? What do you stereotype about me? In small groups and one-on-one, -on -one, the campers continue to discuss their stereotypes. Even as that happens, the staff convenes to assess the progress and make mid-course adjustments in the program if necessary. You'll notice there have been some big changes. Devon just asked me what the changes are about. Real briefly to explain that, um, again, no white staff had gotten a chance to look over the, the flow of the schedule and upon review of the way the process seems to be working for these campers, the schedule changes seem to be the most responsible way of going about getting the campers to the goal for the day. I have a concern, and that is that um, all, most of the campers that I'm dealing with kind of, I feel like they get it already with the stereotypes, and I'm just concerned about the opening, the opening meeting surrounding school. We've talked um, already so many times about public school and private school and parochial school and I just feel like a lot of them are going to fall asleep. We haven't talked about um, continuation schools or, or people that, that have been um, um, displaced from institutions and there, well, we do have students that are, that are so affected too. So it's that's also my rationale behind that. Reiterating the connection between stereotypes, people have acknowledged stereotypes about public schools, private schools, but then connecting that, which is again the goal of the day, to prejudice about being treated differently. I, I hear what you're saying, and I do, do trust you know your read on it, but I would like you to work with us on it. That is part of the magic of Camp Brotherhood Sisterhood, the staff's willingness to change the program according to the camper's ability to understand. The evening part of day three was changed to include another set of racially separate meetings. These meetings were aimed at tackling the group's internal prejudices. What do you think makes you someone black? What do you mean? It's, you, it's your beliefs, your politics, and that you have inside, and your connection with your culture. It's not how you look. In the black African-American group, the campers are asked to place themselves and each other in a line with the people they consider to be most black on one end and those least black on the other. Each person has a different set of criteria. The one common link, their internal stereotypes cause division even within their own racial community. So, but if I go in front of her, you know, then she know. can't be... be the most. Yeah, I know, but then she won't be the most if she wants to be the most. So are you saying that from you on, everybody there considers themselves the most? Is that the what we're saying? 
Yeah, probably. Okay. Is that what we're saying, Will? That's not what I heard. That's, I that's not what I heard. What I heard Amina say was that I'm not the most, I'm just black. Yeah. But, on the other hand, it seems that you're insistent on being at the front in the most. No, that's not even what but I... Then why can't you move to the middle then? Oh, okay. Or why can't you move to the end? You're the one that came to the front well, I the was... most. Is that right? Yeah, that's true, but... No, I'm just putting myself at the end. Uh, make any sense. This is, once again, the most and the least black. In your opinion. Where are you at? Well, I'm black. I know that. Like, okay. The line is made up of black people, I mean. I, I know that, but I'm just... I just don't understand. Never mind. The campers are hesitant to offend each other, but it proves inevitable. Will is placed at the end of the line by two different women in the group. He is hurt and confused. Later, in the process of trying to understand, his stereotypes, as well as theirs, are revealed. I think you heard that I went to an all-white school. I think you've heard the way that I've talked. I think you've maybe seen that I don't dress, maybe is mainstream, I don't know, African-American is a lot of people. And that I don't exactly live in, in a, I guess, in, in the hood or the, the ghetto. And I, maybe, is that a reason why? Because mm -hmm. I go to all my school too, so I don't, I wouldn't, I try not, I wouldn't have a stereotype or I try not to. Because I know how, it, how it feels. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I heard you say things about, you know, living in the hood, living in the ghetto, dressing a certain mm -hmm. way. And, um, that makes me think that you have certain ideas about what black I was people trying to, I was trying to figure out if she was trying to base it on stereotypes. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to figure out. Who's stereotypes? The stereotypes she sees on TV every day. Uh-huh. Do you see those stereotypes? Yeah, I do. We hear them too. We see them too. And they, they do have some impact on us. And I think we're hearing, I'm hearing that, that you're trying to just totally say, I know what they are, but they have no effect on my life. And so what I want you to do is that to kind of look and admit that maybe they creep in sometime. Because I think they do with everybody. I really do. I really do. You're not alone in it. What they're about to do is, you know, is about as difficult as anything I could imagine. You know? We're asking them to uh, be honest with each other about things that are really going to hurt people that they've gone, gotten close to. marks the pivotal point in the week. Up until now, the multicultural community has functioned well on a superficial level. But real communication requires that the campers examine and acknowledge the deep-seated preconceptions they have about other members of the community. Day four is designed to force them into some painful introspection. We think of it in terms of assumptions, assumptions that you make about people when you first meet them without knowing them. If it's too hard for you to t think of it in terms of stereotypes, think about the assumptions, the first impressions you, you make or the first assumptions you make upon meeting someone. And it is hard, but I think that it's, it's, it's liberating and healing to get that out. Certainly can't fix anything until we acknowledge that something's wrong. Each racial group meets and begins to list their stereotypes for the other groups. The preconceptions can be very lighthearted. What I think of like a white person like, Someone with the whole big wallet BMW credit card kind of thing. Or very serious. Not trusting of blacks in terms of the Koreans and the liquor stores. Um, I wanted to tell you about this, the Asian one. There's one on there that says geeks. It means geeks. nerdy. Geeks? Yeah. Okay, not it gooks, right. geeks. After the groups have finished, staff members exchange the rolls of paper. The list will be distributed back to the groups, where the campers will read the things the others have written about them. The calm is about to be shattered, and the staff members will have to deal with it. Try to get them to see that it's better to hear it, better to know, um, better to talk about it, than to just act on it. This is the list of stereotypes that the Latino and Latino group have about black African Americans. The Latino and Latino group think black African American not as much unity as they say they do. Single parent families headed by females, always hyper, pre, pre, prejudiced against non-blacks, black men are troublemakers, believe in conspiracy to keep them down, friendly, welcoming, Malcolm X pushers, cold-hearted, black men are in gangs, dealing drugs, or drug users. Latinos are gang members. Men make sexual comments about women. In the middle, young women fight a lot, 
We have a lack of parental control. We're graffiti writers. We're backstabbers. When you read this list, what do you think they think of Asians? Overall, what does this tell you about their ideas about who you are? We don't want to. Just like they haven't met any. They haven't met any? Yeah, and we don't want to. The effects are dramatic. The community is splintered along racial lines. The campers are hurt and angry. But somehow they hang on to the desire to work through the pain. I'm here. The next step is for two groups to meet and discuss the stereotypes. Again, dialogue is the key. Accept menial labor. I mean, I think that applies to the immigrants. But I mean, acceptance, I don't think that's the issue. It's like, they, they come over here to immigrate, you know, to America, you know, to, you know, the place, you know, where you can make it. And, you know, you don't accept it, that's all you get, you know? They come over here looking for a job, and that's all they can get, you know? They're not offered anymore, they take what they can get because they want to make it. They don't want to have a low job, you know? They want to mow lawns, they don't want to sell oranges, you know? But that's all they can get. Okay, I wrote that, not really, but I told her that. And I said that as a positive thing. I thought it was admirable that people would come to this country accept jobs that weren't the top of the line, white collar jobs. That's why I said that. A lot of, to be honest, a lot of people nowadays don't do that. I, I said it as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Aaron, do you, see, do, you, do you see it as a positive thing? No, I don't take it as a positive thing at all. Because it's, it's, you know, saying that, you know, that it's, it's all we can get, you know. That's, that's all that there is for the immigrants. There's nothing else out there. When you approach somebody who you don't know who's white, I feel that you think that somehow there's no way we could ever understand the suffering that you have. And maybe we can't directly because I'm not black. But suffering is suffering. And, and I think that I can understand suffering. And even if, even if I don't understand the extent of your suffering, I try. No, I don't think you understand. All right. Um, not that I don't want you to understand, but I get tired of hearing people say, oh, yes, I understand how, you know, how your people have gone, what your people have gone through, and, you know, you don't. Yeah, but why does that stop us from being friends? It hasn't stopped me from being friends with white people. But see, but that's there the is, that there is have. I feel that that's, that really keeps people, white and black people, from becoming friends, because Christine, are you hearing Brandon say, though, that even though he doesn't feel like you'll, you'll ever be able to understand, that that doesn't necessarily keep you from being friends? Did you hear him just say that? Yeah. And you, But I, I feel like you're still carrying the assumption that you can't be friends. No, no, no. No, I don't feel that that is... I don't, yeah, I don't feel that, that that's going to allow black people to accept me. Well, what about him? Do you believe what he said? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, there's one. And I think that's a start. I mean, if you can believe him, maybe you can start to believe other people, too. Okay. I wasn't making an, a general statement that all blacks were not clean. But, but just saying that, that we're not clean, I mean, in a way, that's, uh, that's almost just like saying, you know, a generalization because... After meeting one-on-one, -on -one, the campers split up again into their dialogue groups. The painful revelations continue. I have a problem with the I think I'm a second-class citizen. And, um... What does that feel like just to say it out loud? I don't know. And, like, I go around preaching to people when I hear them say stuff like that, you know. Why do you think that? You know, I just argue with my dad for hours on end. And I can come here and say that I think that Latinos are second-class citizens. How does that affect you to hear that? You know, what it, what it... Well, it makes me feel like she's contradicting herself. Because she told me just, I mean, you told me just, when was yesterday, that you were intimidated by me, and now you consider me a second-class citizen? I don't know if I can explain this, but it, it's not something like I, It's not something like I looked at you, and I, um, and I just automatically said, boom, you're lower than me. It's more like... <laughs> It's more like when I get up in the morning and my housekeeper's there who happens to be Latino, I feel like I don't have to treat her with as much respect as I would if she was white. We're trying to make a space where they see things clearly that they don't see in the real world, um, that they deny, that, that the world tends to sugarcoat, that their teachers and the media and whatever, whatever say don't exist. 
Uh, it's kind of like cognitive dissonance. I see this. I'm looking straight at racism, but I don't see it because we're not supposed to. It is so hard to get campers to admit their own stereotypes. And although some progress was made during the daylight hours, the staff is concerned. It seems the campers are still being very defensive. They're intellectualizing the experience instead of really feeling it. Before dinner, the staff members huddle and they decide to change the evening program, adding an exercise called a power grid. It serves to break down the last barriers. You have 15 minutes to rank the four racial groups, Asian Pacific Islander, Black African American, white, and Latino Latina, from most power to least power. You Each group makes a list. What begins as a simple exercise stirs up a hornet's nest of resentments. It's like it's accepted that all the blacks have a struggle, but we, we we're don't. just here. We're okay. Even in, yeah. even in like yeah, history, yeah, just in calm. even in history, like when there was slavery, they didn't even talk about the Hispanics. They didn't even want to deal with us yet. When we were even to the West, they enslaved all the Indians that were here. They made them build all the, the missions and all that stuff, and nobody talks about that. The rankings complete. The groups meet again in the main lodge. Posters crammed with statistics citing racial disparity in education, government and medical services, and the job force paper the walls. Latino youth are 23 times more likely than white youth to be arrested for loitering offenses. When students cut classes out of fear of being beat up, whites are generally referred to a counselor or psychologist. Non-white students are generally referred to a truant officer. Statewide, 75% of those in public detention camps are Latino and black. When the stats are read aloud, the message begins to sink in. But campers are getting perhaps their first look at institutional racism. In a moment, the reality of that racism will be driven home. We're going to read next. The black African-American group's power grid. First in terms of power, the United States, the black African-American group is the white group. Can you please step up? As each group has its list read, the campers physically take their place in the room according to their group's ranking. The power grid clearly separates the oppressed from the oppressors. By the time all four lists are read, the emotional impact has been devastating. This is how the white group sees power in our society. First, white group. Please take place on the stage. exercise is over, the white campers leave to meet separately, while the people of color meet together in the main lodge. The emotion doesn't subside easily. I don't want you to feel powerless, because everything I'm reading right now says that I'm powerless, and it says that the rest of the people in, there, the rest of the people in this group are powerless, but I can't, for my own sanity, I can't leave here feeling like that, and I don't want you to feel like that, because there is something that we can do. If we can decide to do something on one issue, that's a lot of power. When people get mad, sometimes they can do something. So don't, please, please, don't feel like you can't do anything. Don't let them take everything away from you. The community soon meets again as a whole. The white campers say they're confused about what to do to make the situation better. But Brandon makes it clear, apologies won't be enough. I want to be believed. I want you to know that I know what I'm talking about. I want you to know I'm not making up anything so that I can get pity, so that, so that you can feel sorry for me in any way. Another thing I don't want, I don't want is for white people to ever again somehow turn it around to make themselves look like oppressed victims. I am so tired of that shit. You have, you have everything. And if I hear one more person tell me that, well, you know, 
I'm upset about, you know, I don't know how to be around people of color and I don't know how, you know, those bad white people, because I'm different. I just don't know what to do. I'm in a bad situation. <laughs> that, I'm in a bad situation. <laughs> That's all I got to say. And then, a telling moment. Kelly offers to do anything in her power as a white person to help develop a true multicultural community. She asks the group to simply trust her, and she quickly learns there is nothing simple about trust. It's just hard, it's just hard for me to believe. I just totally don't believe what, what she's saying. Okay, she's not believe it. <clears throat> trust is something that, that, that takes a while to build up. It just takes me too long to have trust in her. And I can't just say I'm going to believe her too because that's what she's saying. I just can't take her word for it. You know what would make it easier for me to maybe get to the point where I might be able to trust you, might think about working with you? You're doing what we've been trying to do today, having you be honest with me, having you tell me what's in the way of, you know, you making that connection with me. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't trust you because you got power and I think you're going to jack me up. I think you're going to get me to a place and then you're going to leave me hanging. Now, that's my stereotype about you, and that's what's in the way for me for connecting with you. I want to know what's in the way for you to connect with me. What is that? Day four ends with many unanswered questions and the campers clearly hurting. But the honesty shown during the evening program leaves them one step closer to realizing that dream of a multicultural community. The next day, they'll take another step as they deal with the issue of sexism. Bree will take us through that process when we continue. I gotta push myself, and everybody here's gonna push themselves to be honest with women today. Sabrina would like to say hello. <laughs> say Hi, Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina. Hi. Brenda. <laughs> and Virginia. <laughs> Day five begins with some light-hearted role-playing. Several male campers are asked to portray females so the men can get used to the kind of anger and resentment they are likely to face later in the day. But none of the play acting really prepares them for the walkthrough. No one's going to touch you. No. No one's going to hurt you. Just walk at a slow pace through the line. And you can't touch it. And you can't talk. Okay? Oh, you know you want it. Let me sweep you off your feet. Come on, don't be such a Why don't you go home and take care of the Why kids? Why are you so emotional? No, I know you time. meant yes. Stop being teased. You know you want it. No, I love you. Just show me you love me. It's not my fault you're pregnant. You can get a job. Just don't make more money than me. In the first part of the walkthrough, the men hear the kind of sexist messages women hear every day. The second half of the walkthrough is less subtle. to get to know you. Hey, where are you going, you know? You're hurting my feelings. I just want to get to know you. Don't you trust me? What's wrong with you, huh, bitch? My name is Miko, and I dislike the double standard that exists between male and female. Uh, if a woman sleeps around, she's considered a whole a bitch, a slut, everything but a child of God. And um, when a man sleeps around, he's considered macho, or he got another notch on his belt. And I consider him just as much of a slut, a hoe, and a tramp. After the walkthrough, the men are asked to sit silently and listen to the women. Some of the men are clearly not ready to hear the pain in their fellow campers' voices. If I dress a certain way, because I don't want to dress like it for me, because I happen to wear something, it's not for you. You know, because I happen to be wearing something, it's not like I want every single man to come up to me and say something, and when they do, that makes me feel not like that I don't want to be a woman, and that sucks, that I don't want to be who I am. It makes me feel dirty, and it makes me feel powerless. When I see a female walking down the street wearing revealing clothes, I don't know if you want to call it slutty clothing, whatever, they're looking revealing, I, I begin to think that um, 
I just feel that the way that girls dress determine a lot about the way that they act. Even if I wear tight clothes, that does not mean I sleep around. Where do you get off thinking that I'm a slut because I wouldn't wear something that I think looks good on me? Where do you get off thinking that? The words are starting to hit home, but Mike wants to know why they can't discuss the way women mistreat men. He wants to be heard, but his arguments fall on deaf ears. I want to talk, I want to speak my mind because, you know, when women do this and women do that to me, no. I want you to see what you do to them. No. Or I ain't trying to turn nothing around. You are. You just asked what they feel. Okay. Why they can't express their feelings? Let's not turn nothing around. You're all that I heard in society, huh? A society that's run by men? A society that says, you know, it's all right for me to get hurt? For my feelings not to be expressed? Why do you need to be expressed right now? Why don't you give us one chance to tell you how we feel? How I feel? About being classified? About being objective? Back in dialogue group, the discussion continues. Earlier, Henry, who is Vietnamese, admitted holding the stereotype that Asian women have their place, but expressed no desire to change that belief. And just because of this, it creates a barrier for me, and I, can, I don't think I can continue. I, don't, I know I can't be a friend now. I won't try. I know you think of me that I have my place, I'm quoting you. That sets the stage for a very telling development. Throughout the week, Henry has had a difficult time in the group. He is defensive and contradicts himself at every turn. And now his group mates are angry. Having been fed a heavy diet of honesty, they can no longer stomach dishonesty. I, I don't trust you anymore. And I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable with you the first time because you pretend like you're one way and then you turn another way in. I don't like people like that. Day five deals not only with gender, but sexuality as well. The evening program centers on homophobia and the barriers it creates in the community. The first thing we're gonna do is look at how we perceive or think we perceive what people's sexuality is. The staff and youth leaders take the stage. Campers are asked to place each person under one of three signs. Heterosexual, bisexual, or homosexual. To me, he acts a little bit. Okay. So that's why I think. Nervous laughter fills the main lodge. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, Henry debunks some myths about homosexuality. They can be cured. Cure. Cure implies a sickness. Cure implies a sickness that you can catch. We don't catch being gay or lesbian. It's not something we catch by touching other gay people or breathing gay air. <laughs> Again, it seems very lighthearted. But it doesn't stay that way, and the emotion shared in the last part of the evening opens the door to understanding, just as it has all week long. Is it so painful? To talk about and to um, open yourself up about. Do you think you might lose some friends because of some of your new beliefs or stronger beliefs? I might not lose friends, but just not be as close as I was before. How am I feeling today? I'm like really energetic. I'm like really, really happy. Really, really happy. Sam, Sam and I feel good. Sam and I. <laughs> Day six is a testament to the resiliency of the human spirit. Despite all the pain these young people have felt in the last 48 hours, they seem energized and ready to face the challenge in front of them. The only thing they aren't really ready to do is say goodbye. I don't want to go home. I can't even deal with the fact I have to go home because I don't want to go home. And I feel really, really great today. But getting them ready to go home is the focus of day six. One thing is certain, they are different people than they were when the camp began. The campers in each racial group seem comfortable with their own identity, proud of the things that make them culturally unique.
Nowhere is that more apparent than at the talent sharing. The laughter feels good. The community has come together. Then at the circle sing, the staff members burn the stereotype list the campers made on day four. The fire is blazing, but the moment is chilling nonetheless. so comfortable you know like I sit, I can I feel like I can sit here and talk to you about anything in the world you know and um, I love to hear your laughter I love to see you smile that's what I like about you I feel kind of well kind of sad because um, this and it's ending with everyone here like our community that we built we helped build but then again I'm not that sad because I I feel that um, I came, we came to accompli accomplish something and it's done. You know, at least to, to be, make everyone aware. And that was basically um, the goal that I had at least for myself. There is an old saying, don't hide a candle under a bushel, but instead place it on a hill where it can illuminate all those in the valley. That will be the challenge for these campers. Can they keep their new perspective shining as they go back down the hill? and encounter the same old prejudices. For some, the challenge will be easier than for others. Peer pressure is such a strong force in the adolescent years, and their friends will not likely understand some of the changes they've been going through. But if they are courageous enough, if we are courageous enough, then we can share what we've learned here and give others a reason to change. Good night. this is just the beginning of a process and all my stereotypes and racism isn't gone I know that I'm doing something it's something you need to experience I think yourself but for those of you who can't it's something you should think about and take into consideration and think about it in your heart and try and understand where we're coming from and why we want to change society and the world as it is today so we can have happiness and peace throughout everybody and there won't be those people who feel left out or alone. They really need to um, take responsibility for, uh, for their friends and their family and themselves and uh, not to deny any prejudice that they have and that if they're honest about it, that they can work through it and maybe change themselves. Camp is not real life because real life it's just very messed up. But camp is what can be a really good life.